Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. I'm Karen Mills, and I am lucky to serve this community as president, co-director of Coriolis with Gordon Ritchie. There he is. <laughs> Some small moment of panic. <laughs> and as your service leader this morning, we gather this morning in gratitude on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to our children. I welcome all of you to our service, especially if you are new here or searching for a spiritual home. Many of us were once new here too and looking to belong to something larger than ourselves. We wanted a sense of rootedness to which we could belong and something to hold us as we created meaning together. We do that well here, not perfectly, but well. And this morning we have the first service in what will be our theme for this month, Endings and Beginnings. Seems kind of appropriate with a new year and a new decade. So whether it's your first time in worship with us or your hundredth time, I hope that you'll find here questions that stretch you, people that befriend you, and liberal religious values that challenge you to join us as we search, learn, connect, and serve together. And I'd invite you to quiet any devices right now that beep or flash or tweet. And we will formally begin our service with a prelude from the choir.
opening words this morning are by Deborah Hafner. Happy New Year. Happy New Year for our beloved community. We gather together at the start of this new year as people of many ages, as people of many sexual orientations and gender identities, as people of many races and ethnicities, as people of many theologies and religious backgrounds woven together in our love for this community with our hopes and dreams and our prayers for the year before us, with our hearts and minds and spirits ready to be touched by the year before us, with our hands and time and talents ready to be offered in the year before us. We gather together at the start of this new year with gratitude and love for those who have come before us, for those who stand here with us. May it be a good year. May it be a sweet year. Come, let us worship together. I would like to invite Jennifer to come forward and light our chalice this morning, please. With these words by Katie Gelfand, we call forth the life of our faith by igniting our chalice. This spark of new beginnings invites us into a sacred space to reflect where we have been and where we are going. Ever knowing that this particular flame will intentionally end with our ritual extinguishing, but fear not its end. For we know with brave hearts that for every ending in our lives, we are sent forth to make a new beginning. Thank you, Jennifer. It's always lovely to have our young people here this morning. And so I would like you to uh, invite you to come forward and light your chalice. And as they head off to their class, let us sing them on their way. like to invite Elaine forward for our next reading. I hate goodbyes. I hate everything about them. It bothers me that goodbye isn't really what I want to say. When those I love leave me or I leave them, goodbye isn't what I want to say. I want to tell them that their warm hand on my cheek, which caught my desperate tears, made me feel whole once again. I want to tell them that without their quick giggle and tender words, my life can feel lonely. But no. Instead, I tell them I love you, give them a big hug, and say goodbye. And they leave and I leave. I feel hollow, discontented, and sometimes lost. I didn't want to say goodbye. When those I am in conflict with leave or I leave them, goodbye isn't what I want to say. I want to talk about pieces of me that are torn, scratched, and fragmented because of our interchanges. I want to tell them that maybe, just maybe, I've learned something new in how to be, in how to live, in how to grow. I wonder why it got so complicated and sticky. But no, instead we say with fortitude, goodbye. I may shake their hand, glad that I won't have to see them again. But there is so much unsaid, and goodbye doesn't skim the root of my feelings. I didn't want to say goodbye. When time whispers to me, move on, 
Here's the next step. Say goodbye. I watch as my son walks into his first day of kindergarten, confident, filled with anticipation. These are my people, my life, he is thinking. Bye, Mom, he yells at me and signs love. I sign back. Bye, I whisper. But goodbye isn't what I want to say. I want to tell him that he is remarkable, brave, that I need more time to adjust to his boyhood, his self-assurance, his friends. I need more time to let go of one more tiny sliver of him, but no. Instead, I say goodbye. I feel jolted, awakened to time moving forward without me. I didn't want to say goodbye. When someone I love dies, goodbye isn't what I want to say. I want to tell them the truth about us. I want to set it straight, get to what was real, that their words could hurt, that I wasn't as strong as they'd hoped that I would be, that I still struggle to forgive them. At the same time, I want to tell them that their love made life easier, freer, more accessible that I'm grateful for their presence. I want to tell them that I forgive them for being human, hoping that they did the same for me. But no. Instead, we say goodbye at a memorial service. And I feel captured in a storm of emotions that violently swirl me around. I didn't want to say goodbye. When life turns to me someday and says, say goodbye, Goodbye isn't what I want to say. I'll say, I've said goodbye my whole life. Let me say it right now. Just let me say it right. But life's hands will close around me, ushering me to something new. It will be the only time where goodbye was what I needed to say. Please rise in body or spirit and join in singing hymn number 359, When We Are Gathered. entirely self-governing and self-supporting, and one of the privileges of our free church is to provide all of the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity is one of the spiritual values we celebrate. In addition to supporting our church community, we also make a monthly commitment beyond our walls. One half of the unidentified contribution that's received um, goes to an outside organization, and for the month of January, we're sharing our... um, contribution with change for children if you'd like to learn more about them there's a display set up in the lobby that you can look at after church that tells you a little bit about the organization and the really amazing work that they do and so you're invited to participate in the celebration of giving as the ushers accept the offering if you'd like there are envelopes in the back of the hymnals and if you write your name and information on there then um, contributions over ten dollars will receive a tax receipt And if um, 
you notice that there are people not putting in envelopes or cash, that might just be because they're doing automatic debit contributions or have done predated checks or some other method of giving. But all contributions in whatever form are welcome. And as we accept the offering, we'll hear another piece from Coriolis. <laughs>
As we receive our offering, let us sing together from you, I receive. Kim up for our next reading. First comes The Waiting by Erica A. Hewitt. This is the season of endings and beginnings. When the small signs of dawn pierce through the night and something new is born. But first comes the waiting. First come the lessons of endings and beginnings. The presence of life, the sheltering spirit of love, grieves with those weeping, sweeping of the debris of loss, waits with those who restlessly reach out for changes, grants us courage in the night to guard each other's dreams for this holy, wondrous universe. Grant us, O universe, unfolding in mystery, a sense of your timing. May we loosen our grip on that which doesn't serve us, leaving behind that which we have outworn and outgrown. Teach us the lessons of beginnings. Remind us that such waitings and endings may be a starting place, a planting of seeds which bring to birth what is ready to be born, something right and just and different, a new song, a deeper relationship, a fuller love in the fullness of time. Please join now in hymn number 350. Our next reading is by Rabbi Brad Hirschfield. Think about the moon, the central symbol of the entire Jewish calendar and whose appearance signals the blowing of the ram's horn at Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish holiday of atonement. The old moon, which defines the previous month, vanishes and the new moon appears. But is it really a new moon? Or is it the same moon? The answer is yes. What's true for the moon is true for us. Just as the old moon gets a seemingly limitless number of second chances to be celebrated as a new moon, we too get limitless second chances. Do you celebrate that fact on Rosh Hashanah? Or perhaps... We should celebrate it every day. We can all add a new page in the book of our lives, one which, like the addition of a new page in any book, neither erases or undoes what has come before it, but which can transcend those earlier pages and the stories they contain. Each of us 
get a second chance. A chance to return to the person we most want to be and to the living, the life we most deeply desire. That's the very human promise that lies at the heart of the Jewish New Year. I love the idea that every day offers a possibility of a fresh start. The idea in our reading that just as the old moon gets a seemingly limitless number of second chances to be celebrated as a new moon, we get limitless second chances. That's reassuring and hopeful to me. The reading about goodbyes also resonates with me. I feel more often than not that our goodbyes can't really put into words what we're feeling and that goodbye isn't really what I think we most often want to say. I think it can be important to mark beginning and endings. Sometimes stating a goal or announcing a new venture injects a sense of excitement and a little bit of public accountability. Marking an ending can provide closure and help steady, steady, settle any details that need attention before we move on. In my experience, though, too many new beginnings or significant endings are really tiring. Starting everything from scratch every day would be exhausting. And most often, I think it feeds the myth that we're not good enough or we're not there enough, or we're just not enough yet if we have to keep starting over. I've also found that I can often only see what was a beginning or an ending in hindsight, not really at the time. So every moment, every experience can be a new beginning or an ending. And most often, things begin and end without us expecting it or really having much at all to do with it. We just never know. We're often well in the middle of something before we realize, as Dorothy says, we're not in Kansas anymore. So maybe it's not so much about the beginnings and endings we need to pay attention to, but what's in between. I think the writer Anna Quinlan got it right when she said, life is not so much about beginnings and endings as it is about going on and on and on. It's about muddling through the middle. When I was preparing this service, I came across a piece that really captured for me this concept in a great way, and it's by Reverend Molly Hausch Gordon, who's a minister at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Columbia, Missouri. She was talking to her youth group and asked, uh, who here knows about the book The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Have a show of hands. Okay, good. So... Can anybody in the room tell me how Lucy Pavensi discovers Narnia? Goes through a wardrobe, yeah. And so uh, the minister Hausch explained that Lucy's looking for the perfect place to hide and opens up the door to a big wardrobe. She goes through the door and suddenly she's in a whole other world, a magical world with witches and fawns and talking beavers. Now, wouldn't it be cool if there were a magical world beyond every door? When Lucy opened the door to Narnia, it didn't look like anything special. It was just a boring door of a boring wardrobe full of clothes and coats. And... But across its threshold was magic. Lucy already had a foot well into Narnia before she quite realized what was happening. Many of the thresholds in our lives are like this. We don't know that we're crossing into another world until we're already halfway there. The door of a church takes us down a pathway of growth we might never have expected. The door of a doctor's office suddenly opens out into a life with a hard diagnosis. A restaurant door opens on a first date and echoes forward into a lifetime. A beloved person's door closes behind you and sends you out into the world of the heartbroken. The door to a library or a gym or a dance studio introduces you to a life's passion you might not have otherwise discovered. We cross these thresholds every day of our lives, for good or for ill, in joy, in sorrow, in bittersweet truth. Truly, even our own front door is a great threshold. No matter how familiar the words within and without may be, Given our lives' reality of constant change, every day we open the same old door again 
only to step out into a world that has completely changed. In this way, there is a new world behind every door awaiting our discovery if we will only encounter it as such. And so perhaps this year, as we start the new year and the new decade, rather than spending our energy formulating goals, resolutions, and plans, what if we just tried to look at what's already here, but with new eyes? What if we opened the same old doors, not worrying about it being a beginning or an ending, but instead working just to be truly present and open to what and who we encounter on the other side of the threshold? My aim this year is not going to be do more, to make more, to revamp, to redo, to change, but to simply be present to what is. I want to start each day not wondering or worrying if it's a new beginning or an ending, but curious about how I can be more aware of the people with me on my journey and how we can best travel together. I've also found that stories can often say things much better than we can just talking. Um, they have a gentle way of putting a lesson forward that's not preachy, but easier to remember. And I don't think I'm the only one who discovered this. But I came across a story that captured everything that I wanted to say, and I'm going to keep with me through the year just to remind me to keep that sense of openness and wonder and being present so I wanted to share it with you, just in case you might find it helpful too. And it's called, Who Loves the Dark? There once was a child who got lost in the woods. As night began to descend, the child became more and more frightened. Now I'm sure any of us would be frightened too in this situation, but what made this child even more frightened was that he had always been afraid of the dark. He was more afraid of the dark than any of his friends or his siblings or his parents or his cousins. He didn't know why he was more afraid of the dark. He only knew that when the sun went down, he was very glad to be inside in his brightly lit house. Well, when the sun was all the way down and the only light was just a tiny bit of light from the moon and the stars, the child got so frightened that all he could do was sit down and cry, which he did. Soon he heard a voice say, What's all that racket? He looked down and saw a mole squinting up at him. I, I'm, I'm lost in the woods, and it's dark, and I'm afraid. Well, said the mole, perhaps you could take your noisy crying farther down into the woods. I hate having to come out of my warm, comfortable, dark hole to tell people to be quiet. <laughs> then the child heard another voice. Go on back to your hole, Mr. Mole. I'll take care of this. The child looked up, and in the direction that the newer voice seemed to come from and the darkness, he could see two glowing eyes looking down at him. Before he could scream, which was his first impulse, there was a flutter of wings, and this creature came down near him, and he could see it was an owl who said, Please excuse, Mr. Mole. He hates to come out of his nice dark hole for anything, to be honest. At this, the child burst out crying even harder than before, because as frightened as he was of the dark, having non-human animals speak to him was beyond his experience and quite frightening in itself. No need for that crying, said the owl. If you just give me your address, I can guide you home. With that, the child did indeed stop crying, partly out of relief that somebody might be able to help him home, and partly out of curiosity as to how an owl could lead him home, with or without his address. But deciding he had little to lose, the child choked back his tears and replied that he would be very grateful to be guided home by the owl to his address. And I hope everyone here has their address memorized in case you should need to be guided by an owl. <laughs> So this strange pair headed off through the dark forest in what the child hoped was truly the direction of his home. And when his fear left him just a little bit, the child looked around. And though the moonlight was dim, he began to notice his surroundings a bit. At one point, he noticed a kind of flower that he had never seen before and slowed his pace just a little so he could have a closer look. 
That, said the owl, as they continued walking, was an evening primrose. Did you know that there are some flowers that only bloom at night? There are moonflowers and night gladiolas, too. Flowers you would never see if you didn't go out at night. After a while, the owl said, as if musing to herself, and of course, there are animals, too, who love the night and the darkness. Me, for example, I love the dark. In the daytime, the light hurts my eyes, so that's when I go into the trees and sleep. To this, the boy replied, well, I like the daytime. I can see to kick a ball. I like the sun at the beach. When the dark isn't scary, it's just boring. Boring, you say, replied the owl, and she clearly had some opinions on the matter to express. But just then there was a fluttering and a squeaking around their heads. It took the child just a few seconds to discern what it was and shrieked, a bat! And he started flailing his arms to knock the creature away, shrieking the whole time. The shape backed away and hovered just out of reach and said, excuse me, but that's just my way of saying hello. Well, hello to you, Mr. Bat, said the owl. The child was out here lost in the forest and I'm helping his find his way home. You're not hurt, are you? Well, said the bat, I'll probably have a bruise on my backside, but I think I'll be okay. But you're a bat, the child cried, a creature of darkness. Weren't you coming to suck our blood? No, said the bat, but I have been eating a lot of yummy insects who would have been biting you if I hadn't eaten them. Anyway, I couldn't help overhearing what you said about darkness being boring. If you want to come just a little bit out of your way, I can show you something really exciting. My parents always told me never to go any place with strangers, said the child. Owl will vouch for me, said the bat. We've known each other for years and years. Owl agreed that Mr. Bat was a perfectly upstanding citizen. So the group went off the path and traveled through the deepest forest for what seemed like just a few minutes, and they came out on the dark beach. Here we are, said the bat. The child gazed out at the beach. It was very gently lit by moonlight and thought, this is beautiful, even in the dark, but I wouldn't call it exciting. Just then, there was a movement in the sand, like a little bubble rising up. Then there was another little bubble, and then another. It looked almost as if the beach in the area were boiling. Then, out of one of those little bubbles, popped a round shape. <gasps> Looks like we got here just at the right time, said the bat. As they watched, more and more shadowy shapes came up out of the sand, and soon the child realized what he was seeing. Lots of baby turtles, hundreds climbing out of the sand. This was truly exciting. Once each turtle shape pulled itself up out of the sand, it started crawling as fast as its legs could carry it toward the water. When baby sea turtles hatch, Owl said in a sort of teacherly voice, they need to find their way to the water. And they almost always do this at nighttime because to find the water, they need darkness everywhere else to follow the moon and the starlight reflecting. Daytime sunlight's too bright and the light is scattered everywhere. Oh, said the child. As they turned to leave and head back towards the child's home, Owl spoke again as if thinking aloud to herself. You know who else loves the nighttime besides the nighttime plants and animals? The moon and the stars love darkness. That's when they can really shine. Oh, they're there in the daytime, but hidden behind a wall of light. But when that wall goes down with the sun, the stars and the moons reveal their beauty. After what seemed a very short time, the child and the owl left the forest and walked down a street the child recognized as his own. He was very happy and relieved, but a little sad to say goodbye to Owl, to whom he gave a very gentle hug and a thank you. He went into his home and, being extremely tired from all his adventures, got ready for bed right away. And before he went to bed, as a matter of habit, he bent down to turn on the night light that he always kept going in the night to keep the dark at bay. But before his fingers touched the switch, he smiled and pulled his hand away. 
He got into bed, pulled up the covers, and let the comforting arms of darkness soothe him to sleep. Amen and blessed be. I invite you now to enter a time of meditation, to relax into your chairs, your backs supported, your hearts open, and close your eyes if that's comfortable. Take a couple of deep breaths. We'll have some spoken words, a time of silence, and then a musical response. The words are by Richard Wagamis, First Nations writer. If you want to give yourself a gift this year, I would suggest his book, Embers of Short Meditations. They're absolutely beautiful. This one is The Beginning of Wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is the same as its attainment, wonder. The truest statement in the world is, you never know. There is always something to evoke wonder, to wonder about, because this world, this life, this universe, this reality, is far more than just the sum of its parts. Even the slightest detail contains far more. The overwhelming awe and wonder we feel teach us more than we can ever glean or come to know of things. In the presence of that wonder, the head has no answers, and the heart has no questions. we have been separately and all that we will become together stretched out before and behind us like stars scattered across a canvas of sky. We stand at the precipice, arms locked together like tandem skydivers working up the courage to jump. Tell me, friends, what have we got to lose? Our fear of failure, our mistrust of our own talents, what have we got to lose? A poverty of the spirit, the lie that we are alone. 
What wonders await us in the space between the first leap and the moment our feet, our wheels, however we move our body across this precious earth, touch down softly on unknown soil? What have we got to lose that we can't replace with some previously unimagined joy? Blessed are you, spirit of life, who has sustained us, enlivened us, and enabled us to reach this moment. Give us courage in our leaping and gratitude in our landing, and share with us the joy of the long and fruitful ministry together. Let us sing hymn number 301, Touch the Earth, Reach the Sky. words today are adapted from a, a prayer and closing words usually said at the service of Jewish New Year, but I thought they applied here today. The days of awe begin with us. May the coming days be days of reflection, introspection, and peace. May we prepare ourselves for the changes in the year to come. May it be a good year. May it be a healthy year. May it be a year of peace for all of us all around the globe. May it be a year of peace within ourselves. May we live our lives with integrity, service, and love. May we be blessed with the strength of this community, of our families, of our friends. May we remember what is truly important in life, and may we remember to be grateful every day. May we all be inscribed another year in the book of life. When we take fire from our chalice, it does not become less. It becomes more. So we extinguish our chalice, but we take its light and warmth with us, multiplying its power by our lives and sharing it with the world. We'll have a postlude. Then we'll have our closing song and announcement.
So I invite you to rise as you are willing and able. Join hands as we join together our closing song.